I came to this issue really out of, I think, the same frustration that most Americans are feeling these days when they look at Washington and Congress, which is uh, this idea that the voice of everyday people is just not being counted, not being heard in Washington. And when you start to examine the basis for that feeling, it's pretty well founded, in my view. The, the reality largely matches the perception that government and Congress too often seems to be co-opted by big money and special interests in the form of a dependency on that money for campaigns. If you look at how campaigns are typically funded at the congressional level, they're very, very heavily dependent upon PACs, upon big money campaign donors, and others who frankly have expectations once those candidates are elected. So it's just a, a function of human nature that when uh, it comes time to vote on important public policy matters, the institution often will lean in the direction of the big money and the special interests and away from what everyday citizens want to see and away from the priorities of, of everyday citizens. It's gotten so bad, I think, that the the kind of relevancy of the institution of Congress and Washington in the mind of the average American is hanging on by a thread. And so I, I decide to really commit myself to this issue over the last couple of years. I've been modeling some very innovative approaches to campaign financing in my own campaign for about four years, and I'd be happy to talk about that as well because it, it kind of it tries to walk the walk of some of the design elements of the legislation mm. that I have introduced. But I really committed myself to this in a uh, concerted way, to understand what the history of campaign finance reform was, to reach out to those who've been most active in this space for years and in some instances uh, decades and have done terrific work, understand sort of what was at the core of the reform that they wanted to see. So the common causes of the world, the public campaigns, the public citizens, etc., have been working and struggling in this space for a long time and deserve a tremendous amount of credit for keeping the issue on the, on the front burner when it comes to changing how we fund campaigns. What's interesting is there's a new set of players coming into mm -hmm. this equation, which I think could be a game changer for the success of this kind of reform, as long as we are ready to, to kind of keep moving in a deliberate fashion and don't expect things to suddenly happen tomorrow. And that new set of players are national grassroots organizations who traditionally have been focused on substantive areas of policy. For example, civil rights groups like the NAACP. Uh, labor groups like the UAW and CWA and so forth, and environmental groups like Greenpeace and the Sierra Club, who in the past would have said, you know, campaign finance reform is not our issue. Our issue is the environment. Mm -hmm. That's what we focus on. That's what we, we talk to our members about. But now they're coming to this issue understanding that the substantive agenda that they want to see mm -hmm. is being thwarted at every turn by the influence of big money. So they're beginning to embrace this. In fact, I think some of them, I mean, the Sierra Club is sort of an example of this, are seeing that the path back to their own membership is to adopt this issue, because many of their own members are dispirited at the Koch brothers' influence and, and the influence of industries like the oil and gas industry, and so they need to say to those members, we're working on the money issue too, to get them re-galvanized around their environmental agenda. And to me, this holds tremendous promise because it, it broadens significantly the reach that this kind of a reform narrative can have. In fact, since we introduced the bill six weeks ago, and I'll come back to that introduction and what I think it represents. But since we introduced the bill, in just the last six weeks, we've had over 400,000 citizen co-sponsors join online petitions in support of this reform, many of them coming 
from those non-traditional organizations that I just mentioned, because their members are really activated around these concerns. So I think there's new opportunities presented. At the same time, I'm not naive about how difficult this task is. I mean, there have been efforts to launch reform of how we finance our campaigns over the years, and they've, you know, they've hit the rocks many times. Mm -hmm. So it was important that we design a bill that had staying power in terms of its content and what it was seeking to achieve, and also that we begin to build and maintain a strong coalition of advocates behind it, which is where I think the people in this room can be um, incredibly uh, helpful and really determine the ultimate success of this kind of, a, uh, of an effort. Let me talk about the bill itself. It, it came together over the last two years as a result of seeking input from many, many stakeholders. I, I came into this with a, a, a good degree and maintain a good degree of humility. Um, I have not been um, toiling in the vineyards of this for decades. I've come to it relatively recently, al although my concern about the issue of money and its influence goes back a good ways. So we, we sort of fielded all of this input and we wanted to design something that the stakeholders felt like they owned and had an investment in by the time we got to the point of introduction. And I mention that because oftentimes legislation sort of just gets conjured up out of whole cloth in some staffer's office on Capitol Hill and is introduced and then everyone's expected to kind of get behind it and embrace it. We kind of did the reverse. We built it from the ground up. We built it with the input and investment of the groups that have a real stake in this so that when we got to the point of introduction, they were ready to go. And that's what I think we've seen in the last six weeks. The goal was to to have a bill that when everyday citizens looked at it and kicked the tires on it, they would come away saying, this isn't just cosmetic, this isn't a set of talking points, it's not gimmickry, this was actually built for us. And I mention that because there were times along the way as this legislation was coming together that I, I really kind of held to that core mission. That was sort of the North Star in this. Make sure that when everyday people look at this, they come away energize, not further disillusion. So here are the three components that we think really have an empowering effect when it comes to the voices of, of uh, everyday citizens. You know, money out, voters in. I like the, the concept of that, and that's definitely what this legislation is designed to do. First, we understood that the participation, particularly in congressional mm -hmm. campaigns, of everyday citizens on the funding side of campaigns is relatively small. So we wanted something that would encourage that participation, make it easier for everyday people to get into the funding part of campaigns. So the first piece is a $25, what we call the My Voice tax credit. It's a $25 refundable tax credit for contributions, small donations to congressional campaigns. And that's there to make it easier for the average person to make that contribution and to participate on the funding side of the equation. For one campaign per election? It's in each year of a two-year cycle. You can get um, up to $25 uh, tax credit in each year of the two-year cycle. So you could, give a to you could get a total of $50 back in the form of the tax credit over the two-year cycle. And that gives more than one candidate. Uh, no, you can you can distribute one that one. however you wish That's among many candidates, but the total that you're entitled to is twenty five dollars in each cycle. So doesn't have to be in your district. Does not have to be in your district. Correct. So that's the first piece. Bring people in, allow more people to participate. Um, look at it this way. If as the Supreme Court has declared money is speech, then no money is no speech. Or little money is little speech. And so we thought a tax credit was an appropriate way to help bolster people's speech in this new world in which we're living, according to this court. So that's the first piece. The second piece is critical because it's what is going to change the behavior of candidates. This, we set up something called the Freedom from Influence Matching Fund. 
And the idea is to create a public matching fund that would come in behind those small donations when they are made to a qualifying candidate, somebody who really is reaching out to the grassroots and we define what those requirements are. But if you're a grassroots candidate and a small donor gives you ten, fifteen, twenty-five dollars, et cetera, then you earn a match, a multiple match on that donation. And under our bill, it's a six to one match with actually a potential for an enhanced match under certain conditions. But that means somebody who gives twenty-five dollars to a qualifying candidate will generate another $150 in matching funds for that candidate. So a $25 donation ends up being $175. The reason that's important is because it's what creates the incentive on the part of candidates to go find those small donors and enlist them. The fact of the matter is the average cost of a two-year congressional campaign is now $1.6 million. So, because this is below the disclosure threshold now, uh, would that's the below the 200 disclosure what threshold. Would the names of these have to be publicly disclosed? In order to qualify for the match, we would have to set up a new way of administering a system like this through the FEC or whatever body would would do it, and you would need that you would need that information. So you'd begin to itemize below the current disclosure level. But frankly, we've investigated that and the software that's available and other things make it uh, very easy for campaigns to manage the kind of system that we're proposing. So the match is critical because that's what's going to make a candidate say, you know what, I can raise enough money by going to everyday people that it's worth it mm -hmm. to do so. Mm -hmm. Right now, if you're given the choice as a candidate, you've got to raise all this money in two years. You've got two options. You can go to a fundraiser on K Street to raise $10,000 from a certain kind of crowd, right? Or you can have a house party in your district and invite 30 people and maybe they give you $25 each, you know, so you've raised $750. What are you going to do in the face of that pressure to raise money? You're going to go do the K Street fundraiser. Under the system we're proposing, if you get 30 people to come, they give $50 because now they're getting help with a $25 tax credit. You've raised $1,500. You then bring a 6 to 1 match in behind that. That's $9,000. you have raised $10,500 by having a house party in your district with real people. That's a choice you can make now instead of going and doing this other traditional kind of fundraiser. So it will bring candidates and members of Congress, I think, back to mm -hmm. their district. It will also... And this is why I think um, uh, Nancy Pelosi uh, and others are particularly keen about this reform, and we're pleased that she's, she's backed this reform, and the whole leadership in the Democratic Caucus has. It will allow candidates who previously could not survive what they call the money primary to really become competitive. It would increase, we believe, access uh, for candidates, uh, minority candidates, women candidates, who may not know the kind of big money crowd that would allow them to raise money to run a viable campaign, but under this system would be able to do that. I was on a panel not too long ago in New Hampshire with Lawrence Lessig and some others. I went up to march in memory of Doris Haddock, Granny D. Haddock, who mm -hmm. at the age of 88 walked from LA to Washington, D.C. Took her 13 months with a sign on her back that said campaign finance reform. And in celebration of, of that uh, march, she's now passed away, they do a tribute in New Hampshire every year. So Lawrence Lessig walked 185 miles in January. I went and joined him for seven miles in zero degree weather. Uh, but, you know, that was sort of an important I think that's um, why Granny started in California. Tribute, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Just saying. She was, she was she's a smart woman. She got a head start that way. Exactly. I was on a panel with, a, with a, a, a woman from Maine who's in the Maine legislature named Diane Russell who's just terrific and she said but for the public financing system in Maine that they have at the state level she would not be in the legislature. She's a cashier. She knows hundreds of people but she doesn't know a lot of people with a lot of money. But because of the way that system is structured, she was able to raise small donations, get some additional public funds, and run a viable 
campaign, you could see that beginning to happen in congressional races if you had a system like this. So we have the tax credit. And by the way, we had a tax credit designed almost exactly like the one I have, except mine is refundable, which means it brings in another sort of 47% of the population. Um, but we had one at the federal level from 1972 to 1986. It was then um, jettisoned in the tax reform of 1986. But it wasn't really used that much because the candidates didn't have that incentive to go recruit the small donors. Mm -hmm. we, we bring both pieces to this equation, and we think that will make a huge difference. And in the modeling of it I've done in my own campaign, which I'll be happy to talk to later, um, I've seen the effect it's had on my own behavior in terms of reaching back to everyday citizens for those small donations. So those are the first two pieces. And then the last piece was we thought there needed to be some, something that took account of this new world of super PACs and outside money that we live with. Mm -hmm. So we designed a provision that says in the last 60 days of the general election, the home stretch, there would be an opportunity for participating candidates to access some additional resources, potentially up to another half a million dollars, um, to kind of keep their voice on the playing field. We understand you can't level the playing field, but we think there ought to be some opportunity to keep your voice on the playing field if you're a good, strong candidate who's trying to do the right thing. Mm -hmm. And this would allow some extra resources to flow in situations where candidates are facing an outside pack coming in and dumping a lot of money into that race. So those are the three pieces. And at core, what they're designed to do is give a voice back to everyday citizens who right now look at the system and say, there's no way my $25 can make any kind of difference. And there's no way anybody is paying attention to me. And there's no way the candidates elected with PAC money and big money in Washington aren't going to lean towards those interests when it comes time to make decisions about economic policy, about environmental policy, about civil rights policy, and so forth. So we think this is good reform. It's meaningful. It's designed well. And we're now at the point where we want to build really strong momentum mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. behind this. We understand that this is not going to happen tomorrow. So we have to kind of sustain this effort. And I'll close with, with this um, observation. We can throw it open to questions. There are many things we need to do to push back against the influence of big money on our politics. And in Washington, we're sort of talking about four or five elements under that framework. The first is disclosure and transparency. So I support uh, the Disclose Act in Congress, and I know there's efforts at the state level, obviously, to do the same thing, because if this big money is pouring in, at least people ought to know where it's coming from. It's un-American to have it sort of thrown anonymously <coughs> into the mix. We need to continue to push back directly on the Citizens United case. Mm -hmm. So I certainly support the efforts to amend the Constitution to allow us to rein in on independent expenditures. <coughs> I think most people here recognize that that's a very tough row to hoe just process-wise in terms of the hoops you have to jump through for a constitutional amendment under the best circumstances. If everybody wanted it, it would still take you probably eight to ten years just to get through the process of it. But it's an important way of, I think, marshalling and channeling some of the anger and frustration out there that people feel. Mm -hmm. There's the reform element, which I'm very focused on. If you view those first two things I mentioned, disclose and the amendment process, as all about kind of reining in the bad actors, the kind of big money players out there, the reform piece is about empowering the good actors, giving them a voice in the system, in their politics, in their government. And that's where I've put sort of my energies over the last couple of years, because I want the empowerment piece of this to be really at the center of it. That's what I think will mobilize people in particular. We're looking at um, voter empowerment issues, particularly right now with the Voting Rights Act, trying to restore key provisions of that to protect access to the ballot box. And then the last thing which is getting increasing attention, and you all know something about it here, is redistricting reform, because that's another source of, of the cynicism that I think the public feels. And that needs to be part of the conversation as well. So there's a lot of things that we can do. 
This is a proposal that can be enacted statutorily if we got 218 votes in the House and we got, you know, 51 votes uh, in the Senate. Uh, you could put a system in place that would give candidates a choice. This can't be mandatory because you're not allowed to force a system under the Constitution. It would be a voluntary system, but we think it's one that many candidates would choose and definitely citizens out there would prefer if it were made available to them. And I think it could fundamentally change the progress we can make on the substantive issues that we all care so deeply about. So that's our proposal. 